Good evening and welcome to Match of the Day. And believe me, it'll be as good a football programme as you've ever seen. It's not only the goals, and there are plenty of those, but the all-round quality of all three games. Top of the bill is a spectacular fourth division match between promotion challengers Colchester United and Sheffield United. We squeeze in this morning's first division leaders Southampton against Manchester City, and that's an injustice to them, but we had to make sufficient room for tonight's finale between sophisticated Spurs and struggling Wolves. Tonight's other headlines, Liverpool continue their incredible run. Today's 4-0 win over Ipswich left Bobby Robson saying, if we had to play Liverpool every day, I think I'd move to Hong Kong. Manchester United also scored four on the 24th anniversary of the Munich air crash. 3,000 Chelsea fans invaded Watford without a hint of trouble, while crisis-torn Bristol City enjoyed their best gate of the season to complete one of the most encouraging days for the game for some time. So it's straight to the fourth division game between Colchester United and Sheffield United. And those of you who tend to enjoy your television viewing rather casually, let me warn you to be on your toes soon after the action starts, as was our commentator, John Watson. Bob Hatton of Sheffield United recently completed 200 league goals. He's with his eighth club and he'll be 35 in April. But he's not the oldest player on the field in this match because the Colchester goalkeeper Mike Walker is 36, approaching his 600th league appearance, and like Hatton, his enthusiasm for the game is a great example to professionals everywhere. Colchester signed number four John Lyons from Cambridge this week. He's a striker, and the fee of £25,000 equals the club record, also paid for number eight Kevin Bremner, and number nine Roger Osborne, who, when with Ipswich, scored the winning goal in the FA Cup final. An experience shared by Ian Porterfield, then with Sunderland, and now the manager of Sheffield United. Last night, he agreed a fee of £100,000 for the Blackpool winger Colin Morris, but his team today includes four earlier Porterfield signings. Goalkeeper Keith Woff, right-back Paul Richardson, number nine Keith Edwards, and number 11 Jeff King. Sheffield United in red shirts and white shorts have got quite a run going here, unbeaten in their last 17 league games, and only two defeats in 22 fourth division matches so far this season. The referee this afternoon is one of our FIFA officials, Clive White from Harrow, and Colchester are wearing the stripes. It'll be Richardson with the throw. Looks for Edwards. Flicked on by him, Hatton is battling for it. Away by Adcock for Colchester. That was Tony Kenworthy. That's Osborne for Colchester. To Bremner, to Lyons now. Looking for McDonough. And it was turned back by Garner for the corner. Lyons got a touch, up, oh, and Wignall was in there as well, and it's gone in. Well, the Colchester players are going to congratulate John Lyons, and it was certainly his header initially, but I think it must have touched somebody else before it went over the line. Allenson's corner, in comes Lyons, and in fact it goes in off Stuart Houston, and you could probably call that an own goal, although I would imagine they'll find it very hard to prevent Lyons from claiming it. And Sheffield United find themselves a goal down. So what a good start for Lyons there, his first important touch. Corner to Sheffield United to be taken by Matthews. So Sheffield United needing a quick reply here. They've got Trusson waiting to come in with Hatton. Oh, driven by John Matthews, but well away. Kevin Bremner 
trying to turn Houston in quickly. Here's McDonough. Bremner. Bremner goes down. And another corner to Colchester. Lions in there again. and Roy McDonough was in. 2-0 to Colchester. Both goals coming from corners. And this one, after eight minutes, has to go down, I'm afraid, to Keith Woff. Adcock returning the ball in. Woff coming out, not meeting it. And McDonough got his head in. And it's 2-0. So what a start for Colchester. Two in eight minutes. That's number 12 of the season for Roy McDonough. Used to be with Walsall. Had a little spell at Chelsea where he didn't get into the first team, but doing well here. That's Cook. Richardson, Osborne. Now Longhorn. This is Lyons. Oh, handball. And it'll be a booking, I fancy, for Paul Garner, who handled there to prevent what might well have been number three for Colchester. Clive White takes his name. Allenson has scored 18 goals this season, number 11, and he's well known for his expertise at set pieces in the fourth division. That's his drive, it's there! This is a sensational opening by Colchester. Woff beaten again, this time by Ian Allenson, who scores his 19th goal of the season. And what about this from Colchester United? Three goals in ten minutes. And Sheffield United, unbeaten since last September in the league, just don't know what's hit them. Garner, who gave away the free kick. This is Trussell. Away by Wigmore. Tangle between Kenworthy and Lyons. Header back by Wright. Matthews. Kenworthy. This is Hatton. Costian intercepted by Roger Osborne. Nicely played between him and Adcock. And they've got three front runners again here, Colchester. Bremner. Lyons. McDonough. Well, one ought to make the point that the last two matches at Leia Road before today had produced 13 goals, a 4-3 win for Newcastle in the Cup, a three-all draw between Colchester and Hartlepool, Well, Colchester have scored three again today for the third time in succession, but they've all come in the first ten minutes and so far without reply. Hatton, foul by Wignall, coming into the back of Hatton. Stuart Houston! And Walker dropping on it. It almost seemed comfortably at the end. It was a very good save as Houston came in, beat the defender in the air, and Walker was alert.
Lions. And played by Allenson. While Sheffield United have conceded two corners and one free kick to their great cost. And here they are defending again against a free kick just outside the area. So far, the set pieces have been their undoing. is having an absolute nightmare and Ian Allenson gets his second goal by floating that free kick straight in. Ian Allenson just floated the free kick in. There were players waiting to come in on it, but they didn't have to bother. The ball went over the goalkeeper's head. It's Allenson's second, it's Colchester's fourth. And this first half, certainly one of the most eventful that I've seen this season but Sheffield United would prefer to forget it. So Allenson takes his total for the season to 20. to have risen to the occasion with a larger attendance than usual inside Lair Road. It seems to have lifted their players. Sheffield United for the moment. Oh, a trip and a penalty. Jeff King, the man pulled down. Just when nothing seemed to be going right for Sheffield United. King just cutting onto the edge of the area. Colchester contesting the decision, but referee Clive White had no doubts at all. Penalty to Sheffield United and a chance for Tony Kenworthy to get one back. And he does. Kenworthy's eighth goal of the season. fourth from the penalty spot as he puts it away very nicely having sent Mike Walker the wrong way so 39 minutes gone and what excitement we've had here Colchester 4 Sheffield United 1 who says the game is no longer entertaining Osborne to Cook, and Mickey Cook's drive blocked by Kenworthy. Osborne for Colchester, free kick. Wignall, but it was Trusson that put it out. Well, four goals to Colchester, two from corners, two from free kicks. Can they do it again from Adcock's corner here? And away by King for another corner. Is up. Oh, and Lyons almost flicked it in. And the referee blows at the end 
of a first half which these Colchester players will look back on as one of their most impressive performances of the season. Bob Hatton and Sheffield United demoralised and no one more so than Keith Woff. Possibly fouled on the first goal but certainly to blame for two of the others. And Colchester's Ian Allenson, scorer of two and also involved defensively in giving away the penalty from which Sheffield United at least got one back making the half-time score 4-1 to Colchester. Stuart Houston admitting to the own goal, but I think it'll be very difficult for Colchester to take that away from John Lyons. Certainly he'll try and claim it. So away go Colchester. Allenson on the ball, looking for his second hat-trick of the season. He got one at Mansfield in an away win. Here's Wright. Cook, oh, that was Jeff King leaving Allenson on the ground. And being spoken to by the referee, Jeff King. Wignall gets up and maybe leaning as he did so. And Keith Woff, seeing it's two against two up front, trying the long kick, but it was won by Wright for Colchester. Here's Cook. Adcock's pulled away to the left. Oh, some space here for Bremner. Kevin Bremner makes it five. Well, Sheffield United left a gap in their defence, which you could honestly have driven a bus through, but that's taking nothing away from Kevin Bremner, who collected the ball, saw what was on, and took his time to finish perfectly. So that came right on the hour, and Colchester now have equaled their best score of the season, 5-1 against Northampton back in October, 5-1 again today, but with half an hour still to go against Sheffield United, and here's Lyons. Bremner's racing forward in the centre again. Bremner turning it on, Osborne's well forward, good block by Woff. which Roger Osborne himself applauded. Lions up with the goalkeeper, whose punch, fortunately for him, fell to the feet of King. And in goes Longhorn. Colchester will shortly have to make a substitution because Longhorn has a groin injury. And luckily for them, or perhaps uh, wisely for them, the substitute is a fullback. Adcock. Oh, did that nicely. Bremner's pulled away to the far post. Here he comes heading it down. A chance perhaps there for Allenson, but taken away from him by Houston. Nice play that by Sheffield United. Matthews, though, lost it to Osborne in midfield. And it's on now for... Co oh. Was on. Longhorn stretching. Neville. Oh, Edwards! Sixty-two minutes gone, and Keith Edwards gets one back for Sheffield United. Made on the right by Steve Neville, who got the ball in. Colchester didn't get it away, and Edwards swivelled and finished nicely. Well, no complaints about the entertainment at Leia Road this afternoon. 5-2 the score, and still 27 minutes left. just when Sheffield United look to be in danger of being totally routed, they pull a goal back. Well, they did say Lair Road was the place to come for goals. Seven in the cup match against Newcastle, six in the last league game here against Hartlepool, and seven so far today. You can't argue with that sort of scoring ratio. 
and there may be more to come. Matthews, his Edwards. His control again. Oh, Steve Wignall just got a block on it. Corner to Sheffield United, whose fans still haven't given up hope. Colchester, meantime, wish to make a substitution. On goes Phil Coleman to replace the injured Dennis Longhorn. Houston getting up at the near post. Allenson to get the ball away for Colchester. To Mickey Cook. Allenson. to Cook, nicely played by him, Bremner, and his Cook, good block by Richardson, Bremner again, away by Garner, and Neville looking for Edwards, that was a fair ball, and Edwards on his way again, Bob Hatton making strides on the far post, coming in now, good save by Walker. You would normally back Bob Hatton to bury those. Neville put Edwards away on the left. Hatton pulled away to the far post. The cross was perfect. Hatton closed in. And what a fine block by Mike Walker. What well, a day that the Colchester United fans won't forget in a hurry. A handsome victory over one of their promotion rivals. And a day that... John Lyons won't forget either. Making his debut for Colchester United. He'll certainly have a go at claiming the first goal, which went in off Houston. But the important thing from Colchester's point of view is that they scored five, and that means now that in the last three matches at Leia Road, the crowd have seen 20 goals scored. So perhaps this is the place to be for entertaining football. Well, I know how many of you feel you don't see enough matches from the lower divisions, and I'm sure you've all enjoyed that game, and there's no doubt, and we're aware of it, that it doesn't weaken your argument. Colchester's win takes them into third place above Sheffield United on goal difference. Wigan stay top despite being held to a 1-1 draw at home to Hartlepool. Bradford City, however, looked best placed. They moved up to second after their 3-0 win at York and are now just a point behind Wigan with a game in hand. Well, let's see if the first division can live up to the standard of the entertainment we've just seen. That challenge is thrown down to Southampton, first division leaders for just one week, and Manchester City, with ambitious eyes on that coveted position. We join the match ten minutes into the first half, Southampton playing from right to left and in possession. Your commentator, Alan Parry. That was Powell's header. Now Alan Ball. Shannon, Keegan's run forward, but uh, McDonald read it. Very, very quick this game, and no quarter given in the tackles either, as Golak finds Hebert superbly. Baker is arriving in support. Hebert kicks him out, and the header just wide. Fine move, though. Trevor Hebert intelligently taking the ball down the right, saw that Baker had come forward in support and found him, but the header just wide of target. And Power has done well to keep that in. Waldron. And the pace unrelenting. Golak for Southampton. Hebert again making an intelligent run. What a good tackle by Caton. It's a corner, although Caton says it isn't. So plenty of potential trouble in there for the Manchester City defenders. Hebert on the near post, Keegan near the penalty spot, Waldron and Nickel coming forward too. And it comes to Baker! Well, that really was a good opening. And as the corner was driven over from the right, 
the headed clearance found Baker unmarked in space. He had time, but he lifted his shot wide. Now Mick Shannon. McDonald very close, but Shannon's done so well. And a good cross too. Corrigan got it clear in spectacular fashion. What a splendid piece of play by Corrigan. A spectacular clearance. And Mick Shannon had done so well. Good control and pace to get round McDonald and the cross. Fisted clear by Corrigan. Armstrong. Ranson intercepts. Kinsey's gone wide to help him. And here he is. And two in the middle. He's a good cross of the ball, this boy. But, but not so good on that time. Nickel got it clear. Ranson. Francis. Nickel right behind him. Good turn. Oh! Well, that was a superb example of the skills of Francis. And as Reeves came in, in the centre of the goal mouth, the ball was turned behind by the defender for a corner. But what a marvellous piece of skill by Trevor Francis when nothing seemed on. Well, the corner came to nothing. It was still nil-nil at half-time, and the match continued at a furious pace in the second half, which we join with half an hour to go. Here's Nicol. He was strong enough to go through those two tackles. And the referee has angered the crowd by giving the throw to Manchester City. Francis. Good ball up for Reeves. Power really getting forward quickly. Good run this by the City captain. And not a bad shot at the end of it either. The best effort of the game, no doubt about it. A quick break by Manchester City. Look how quickly Power got forward. When the ball was played to him, he held his ground well, got in a fine shot, and Katalinic made the save. City's best effort then. And now Kinsey. Giving it away. Agbula. He's done well. Shannon looked as though he may have been pushed then by McDonald. The referee once more has set play off. Armstrong's head up. Hebert battling well. And still, Armstrong takes over. Oh, a lovely ball. Baker. 1-0. A marvellous goal. The first of the season for Graham Baker, but exactly an hour gone. Southampton celebrate what could be a very vital goal. And David Armstrong plays such a vital part in it. That measured through ball, right into the stride of Graham Baker, who took it on, and that right foot shot, finding the space between the goalkeeper and the post. Southampton 1, Manchester City 0. And that, I'm sure, will improve the quality of this match, which up to now has been notable for its furious pace and its hard tackling. Laurie McMenemy, who believes that Southampton can stay at the top of the first division. Delighted with that goal. And Manchester City used that opportunity to bring on their substitute, Arga Harida, the Norwegian international. Tommy Hutchison, the man to go off. And Southampton beginning to flow. Baker, Keegan. Dell buzzing with noise now. Manchester City have been playing better away from home of late, with a real battle on their hands to get back into this game. Francis, Baker, new lease of life from that goal, and finds Armstrong, Ransom's tackle. First touch for Harida. Francis. Harida still going forward. Francis with the ball. Here's the Norwegian again, and again Francis. Good looking ball, Reeves is unmarked. Katalinic made the save, and Southampton defenders turn and ask each other who should have been marking Kevin Reeves. Francis 
combining with Harida, got in a marvellous cross. Reeves was totally unmarked, and they feel he should have done better with the header. McDonald looking for Reeves and finding him well. Here's Francis. It's a good ball. Reeves gets it in. Power shot deflected. It's a lovely ball. Francis down the left to Reeves. The cross came into the middle. Power got in the first time shot. Deflected for a corner. Intense concentration by Golak. Superb goal, and once again, McDonald's ability to get forward the corners has paid off. McDonald's fourth goal of the season, headed powerfully into the roof of the net, and Manchester City are back in the match. The corner floated over towards that near post. McDonald came storming in and headed it into the roof of the net. Always was going to be first to that ball, and that Southampton won, Manchester City won. And it could be quite a finale. Keegan in space. Baker arriving quickly in the box. A flayed behind him, and it still comes to him. And now Shannon. Armstrong, 2-1. A goal within seconds. David Armstrong joins in the celebrations. And poor Joe Corrigan, who seemed to have saved the initial shot, could do nothing as Armstrong came in with a simple tap over the line. Two goals in less than a minute. One for Manchester City, but that one by David Armstrong makes it Southampton 2, Manchester City 1. Well, it's all happening, isn't it? And it looks as if in especially heady fashion in Hampshire. Well, now to our last match tonight, which is the one I saw and enjoyed immensely. It was a particular pleasure to be at White Hart Lane with commentator Barry Davis today, as it was a day of justifiable pride for Spurs, the official opening of their new luxury stand. And who better to perform the opening ceremony than Sir Stanley Rouse, who's graced the football scene almost since they built the first one. Spurs side for this historic match is unchanged from last Wednesday. A side that's having a run of seven matches without defeat. And it's fitting that Wolverhampton Wanderers should provide the opposition because they played it in the first game here back in September 1908 when Spurs first came into the league. And Tottenham have gone to considerable heights since then. Spurs with the win behind them in more senses than one. Very much involved in four competitions. For Wolves, the season will be a struggle to the end to avoid relegation. The referee for this historic match is Trevor Spencer of Salisbury. Mark Falco, who would like to get on the score sheet. He hasn't done so since he came back from injury. No foul given. Here's John Richards. Gray. Crooks. Galvin. Does that so well. And a bad back pass, and Bradshaw did really well. Very sharply out at the feet of Falco. Brazier who made the error. Brooks. Perryman. And close to Huddle. Marco drawing Gallagher with him. Huddle. Oh, what a great ball. A bit off the cush, but never mind. Cuton. Beautifully left and good challenge by Berry. Galvin. Marco underneath and Gallagher looking very awkward, and that's a penalty. 
Well, there was no doubt that the arms were round. And the penalty has been given. Gallagher protesting innocence. Obviously troubled by the wind, but his arms were certainly around Falco. How much pressure he exerted is debatable, but in the opinion of Mr. Spencer, it was enough. And Huddle, who the last time he took a penalty on this ground, had to take three against Peter Shilton and didn't succeed. Now tries against Bradshaw and does. It's actually his first goal for 11 matches. Coming in the tenth minute of this match. Bradshaw going the right way, but beaten by the pace. Berry. Atkinson. Humphrey drawn forward. Adilis. Huddle. Well cut out by Berry. For what vision? And it very nearly worked. Beer. Comes to Adilis. Falco. Huddle. It was Brazier, whose block was the most important. And I think we can say the crowd enjoyed that. Hibbert covering well but at the expense of the corner. Looking at Kenny here, it gives me a chance to put the record straight for Spurs supporters. In the semi-final, he says he did not dive, never said that he dived, but he didn't think it should have been a penalty. Ardiles. Via. Galvin. Huddle. Oh, what a lovely strike of the ball. Had the time to set his sights. And brought a very good save out of Bradshaw. Sort that he would expect to make with the ball rising, but even so. In comes Miller. One by Huddle. certainly didn't stand on ceremony. Huddle. The afternoon looks made for him. Oh! And how could anybody say about him playing on the left side for England? It doesn't matter what side he plays on. Hewton. Atkinson huddles back. If it's sent away. And two thirds of the first half is gone. Just one goal between the two teams. It's Beer. Huddle. suggesting there was an almighty swerve on the ball. Certainly he was beaten by the flight of the ball. And Villa makes it 2-0 for Tottenham. And after a couple of moments of frustration from the big Argentine, 
He plucks it right there. Not the happiest of start for Ian Greaves as the new manager of Wolves. Played by Crooks. Via. And he very nearly did it again for a totally different strike. Didn't come up very much. And I suspect it beat the hand, but it beat the post as well. If it's Via Huddle. Just magnificent. Galvin. Berry just got the foot. Total appreciation for the White Hart Lane crowd. Gray, Atkinson, Richards, Brazier, Richards. We get given against Price. Crowd anticipating a strike by Hibbert. And Clements has got the right side of his goal covered. Oh, I must say that's a pretty long ten yards, Mr. Spencer has uh, measured out. I would think that certainly is nearer 15, but let's face it, it makes a change. Hibbets, and he scores. <laughs> and Ray Clements disappointed. Hibbet delighted, his second goal in a week. But there'll be a few complaints from Tottenham about that. Because 10 yards, it says in the law book, I'm afraid I would have to argue with Mr. Spencer's estimation of what is 10 yards. 2-1. Makes it a match again. Gives a bit of life to Ian Greaves' side. And Crooks cut off at his prime. As the whistle blows for half-time. Spurs leading by two goals to one. The first from Huddle has been somewhat like a Steve Davis on the pitch. The second coming from Villa. And then Hibbert at the death of the first half, making it a match again. The last seconds of the Rugby International being watched on one of the boxes. And Tottenham are getting the second half here. Really having to begin again. A match seemingly well won at 2 nothing, But now they've got to exert their superiority once more. Here's Ardiles. Interesting to see what effect Hibbert's late goal in the first half has on the match. First free kick of the second half goes against Gallagher. He's pushing his luck a little bit. Has already gone in Mr. Spencer's book. Well, Crooks is there, might move away, he did. But it was too high. Well, Spurs obviously thought there was a deflection from the corner. The linesman unmoved. The referee unresponsive. Huddle <laughs> once more. Good decision by the linesman because Farco was offside on the far side, but Crook certainly wasn't. Here's Galvin. Oh, he's done well to put it back. Villa! 
His second goal. But the man deserving of the greatest congratulations, undoubtedly Tony Galvin. Showing then the supreme ability of a winger, although there's more to his game than just being a winger, getting right to the goal line and pulling it back when it seemed too late. And the angle beat the defence and set up there. So the corks are popping once more. Galvin. Hewton. Veer. Crooks. Oh, it's too short. Or rather, Ardides wasn't close enough. Hold the ball has to cross the line, and we can see that it didn't. Free kick would have been given anyway because Mr. Spencer has his arm aloft. Otherwise, that would have could so easily have been the most curious goal of the season. Hibbert. There's a gap for him. to Berry again with the challenge. Via. That's his hat trick. And Crooks, who was almost in another county when he got the ball. And they go to congratulate the big man. Who is the handball of Tottenham says wrote his name into Spurs history last May. And has now got a coveted hat trick. Hibbets. Lovely strike. His first hat trick for Tottenham. Falco, Via, to Perryman, they're queuing in the middle. Crooks, oh, what a hit up! That was an absolute bullet! Perryman who provided but the power of the header, it screamed into the net. And if it wasn't for the fact that he'd take so much stick in the dressing room, I would make a comparison with a famous number 10. And he looks quite like. That's wide from Atkinson. Clark, we will substitute. And Ross, the coach. Adilis. Atkinson. 
And Miller just getting a foot in. Mickey Hazard waiting to come on to replace Garth Crooks. Lovely touch. Fear. Crooks. Perryman. And <laughs> rather Galvin. Huddle. This is Perryman. I was ahead of the game. Delighted. Desperately wanted a goal. Perman deep in the box, provided again. Six one the score. And the substitutes have come on. And the players replaced both number 11s. No doubt at all that Sir Stanley Rouse has thoroughly enjoyed this. Offside given. Now just a question of what Mr Spencer's got on his watch for the odd stoppage. Adidas. Galvin. by Humphrey. Tackle from behind that got the ankle. Miller. And the party's over. But the guests are full to overflowing. Three goals for Ricky Villa. One each for Hoddle, Crooks, and Falco, and the champagne has really flowed as Spurs celebrated the opening of their new stand. As for Wolves on this afternoon, they were simply there for the killing. Well, before Wolves fans get too disappointed with that result, let me say that at times this afternoon, Spurs played inspired football. There were quite a few outstanding performances, not the least from the Latin American contingent, but most England supporters would have warmed to the performance of Glenn Hoddle. His ball skills were electric, his shooting powerful and accurate, but the strength of his game was pumping a succession of perfectly directed and paced through passes which lacerated the Wolves' defence. And if you think that the case for Glenn's inclusion in the England team is unarguable, well just remember that Ron Greenwood's problem would then be to find and select forward players with the pace and the running power to make those passes count against the best defences in the world, which is the object of the exercise in June. Well, that's not my problem, thank goodness, but it is my pleasure to pick one representative and extraordinary pass to make that point about Hoddle. Why it was so extraordinary is because he deceived everyone except the running man... Perryman. You can see as the ball's laid there, Peri uh, that's Glavin on the ball, it's laid back and everybody's expecting it to the left-hand side of the field. You can just catch a glimpse of Perryman's run on the right and that ball was sliced off the outside of the put. Checked perfectly there for Perryman also to do uh, a rather useful volley and really make the day for me. That was special. Well, Spurs' win was the biggest in any First Division match this season. Although they're currently ninth with 36 points, they have played three matches less than the leaders, Southampton. Manchester United stay second after coming from behind to beat champions Aston Villa 4-1. Kevin Moran scored twice. But the team of the moment continues to be Liverpool, who beat championship favourites Ipswich for the second time in four days. The result this time was 4-0, and it took Liverpool from sixth to third place with a game in hand. Their record in the new year is quite remarkable. Played 10, won 9, drawn 1, with a goal record of 28 against 2. Ipswich go back to Anfield next week for the second leg of their League Cup semi-final. And when he left tonight, Ipswich manager Bobby Robson said to Liverpool's Bob Paisley, see you on Tuesday, to which Bob replied with a smile, are you going to turn up? No real change at the bottom of Division 1, with the exception of Wolves, who we saw beaten at Spurs, the other five teams on the caption all drew. The manager of one of those clubs, Alan Clark of Leeds, seems to have more problems than most just now. 
Already in dispute with England winger Peter Barnes, Clark today accused his senior players of ignoring his instructions. Said Clark, I tell them one thing and they are doing the opposite, which I will not accept. Trouble also at Birmingham, where their worst crowd for 15 years, just under 11,000, chanted what a load of rubbish as City drew nil-nil with bottom club Middlesbrough. There was a happier crowd story in Division 2 when 3,000 Chelsea supporters defied the recent FA ban on travelling but were allowed to watch their team's 1-0 defeat at Watford. The police said it was safer to let them into the ground rather than cause trouble in the streets and happily they behaved themselves. That victory with a Luther Blissett penalty took Watford into second place behind Luton who drew 3-3 at Sheffield Wednesday thanks to Brian Steen's last minute equaliser. A crowd story from Division 3 as well. Nearly 10,000 fans gave Bristol City their best league gate of the season with the directors helping out by paying for their own tickets to see the goalless draw with Fulham. And today's results mean they, means there's no change in the top five, although Chesterfield now lead by two points after beating Walsall. Finally, pools, and although there were seven score draws and nine no-score draws, dividends will still be fairly good. Claimed by Telegram for 23 points, and the three-point numbers are 19, 22, 29, 32, 35, 38, and 41. The no score draws worth two points are 1, 3, 9, 17, 23, 25, 30, 43, and 46. Well, finally, the result of the Goal of the Month competition, and like last month, not an easy one to decide, but for different reasons. There wasn't a lot of doubt among the panel about the winning goal, though, and it was that cheeky chip from Coventry's Peter Bodak. Goal eye, and it was scored against Manchester City. Every man to the helm. Dyson won it. Butterworth, even then, was prepared to play the right ball, not just hoop it anywhere. This is Bodak. Would he go in on goal? Oh, he tried the most delightful trip! And the first postcard pulled out with the winning IHA order was sent in by Mr J.H. Cruisden, 12 Chapman Crescent, Humberston, Grimsby. Well done, Mr Cruisden. 100 pounds worth of television licence gift tokens are on their way. Well, when Keith Berkhamshaw pulled his two Argentine rabbits out of the hat just after the last World Cup, not everyone was immediately convinced it was a good move. It didn't take long for Aussie Ardeas to convince the doubters of the soundness of that investment. But his compatriot, Ricardo Villa, took longer to settle. And at times, the glamour of England for him meant Spurs reserve. But Ricardo has the knack of exploding on the big occasion. He did it in last year's cup final replay, and this afternoon, his explosion made it a big occasion, and it was a privilege to be there to see it. We'll see you next week, I trust, after I have my shoulder straightened out. Good night to you. I think the goal I scored with the head, you know, I know I score many and I think it's, it's a nice goal in, in football. It's the most nice goal when you score, score with the head. Here's Galvin. Oh, he's done well to put it back. Villa! Brooks. Three to put it back to. Berry again with the challenge. Villa! That's his hat trick. <laughs>